good morning and welcome to South Lancaster Academy's Alumni Sabbath. We are in our 132nd year of continuous operation. God has truly blessed our school. Let's consider a bit of background history. Eight years ago, South Lancaster Academy had an enrollment that was declining. This is sometimes called the death spiral. There were serious concerns about the future of the school. At that time, in cooperation with Southern New England Conference, an investigation was conducted to determine, number one, where the students were located within the area churches, and number two, why they were not in Christian education, and three, the public perception of South Lancaster Academy. What was discovered was enlightening. Southern New England Conference has become a microcosm of, of the Adventist Church in North America, that of eth ethnically diverse groups. These ethnically diverse church groups are where the majority of the youth are located. There was a major fear of the cost of education to the families of these groups. This hindered many from enrolling at SLA. The financing of a child's education was and still is a major challenge for many of our families. At that time, the public perception of South Lancaster Academy was not positive. The school was viewed as a decaying, uncaring, and academically me mediocre institution. It had become evident that the very survival of the school meant that South Lancaster Academy had to change both, both physically and philosophically if it were to continue into the future. A challenge was issued by then conference president, Frank Tochterman, to develop a plan that would open the doors for students to enroll in our school. The school board initiated a major revision of the school constitution, creating a clear path to constituency. Plans were developed for changing the image of South Lancaster Academy. Over the next two years, changes were made to buildings, programs, and philosophies were adjusted to better address the mission of providing Christian education to all families and students desiring it. After all, our children are our future alumni and church leaders. Focus on the physical plant and deferred maintenance was addressed. Like a church, our church school is a representation of God. First impressions, appearances, safety, and cleanliness are important to parents who are considering placing their children in our care. Establishing an attitude of customer service throughout all of the staff when working with families helped tremendously in changing the public image of the school and reduce, fear, reduce the fear of becoming part of this institution. The financing of education was addressed. First of all, to be a church school, we must have students to teach. Southern New England Conference funds about 50% of the cost of education at South Lancaster Academy. <clears throat> our constituent churches and alumni provide additional substantial monies to support our school. Parents have a part in that cost also. Today, we work with families financially to make sure that students remain enrolled. All parents are required to contribute to their children's education. There is no free ride here. This creates a good situation where parents maintain a positive image of themselves throughout, through their ability to pay for their children's education and their financial sacrifice involved with that. Remember the widow's might. The academic program perception was also addressed. The North American Division study of student academic performance called Cognitive Genesis demonstrates the academic strength of the Adventist academic program. SLA mirrors the results of this study. On standardized tests, students that are consistently participating within the Adventist school system perform better than their counterparts in other institutions. Accuplacer testing of SLA junior classes for those that are unfamiliar with the Accuplacer, the Accuplacer is a college readiness or placement test which measures math and language skills 
for placement into college level classes. This is a measurement of where their learned skills are where they're at. In contrast, the scholastic aptitude test measures a given student's aptitude for math or language. The scores of the, our 11th graders on the acupuncture clearly demonstrates the strength of our program. <clears throat> our juniors routinely meet the entry requirements for college level English. There is no need for remediation. The math scores are at grade level. All this is a full year before completing high school. 95% of our graduates go on to post-secondary education. About half of our graduates attend as SDA institutions with the remaining seeking local options. There was discussion that we only accept the very best students for enrollment. This would be counter to our mission as a Christian institution. We accept those students who are seeking a Christian education. We accept students from all walks of life, all econ economic backgrounds. Of course, this acceptance is on the uh, consideration of their academic needs. Like Jesus and our church, we are not an exclusive institution for the elite. We are for everyone. With these changes in 2010, during the bottom of the Great Recession, our open enrollment went up 15% from its low point of the previous year. The same year academic, or the same year Atlantic Union College shifted into idle, naysayers were predicting our demise. We did lose students. However, God provided for us with another 15% increase over the previous year. God is leading and blessing our efforts. Our enrollment today is the highest it's been in many years. The total school enrollment is 325 students. The academy is at its maximum capacity and most of our elementary classes are either full or very close. <clears throat> you need to hear about what makes us a Christian school. What makes us different from other academic institutions. Our school chaplaincy program is second to none. Within the last couple of years, our chaplaincy has been recognized as one of the most active, widespread, and inclusive programs in the North American division. Our students participate with weeks of prayer, spiritual outreach activities, weekend, and community service activities. There are opportunities for every student to minister in music, public speaking, prayer, and other performing arts and spiritual gifts. Annually at our Harvest Baptism, many of our students give their lives to Christ usually in the area of 15 or 20 of them. This is demonstrating the school is an effective evangelistic tool for our church. The baptisms are a high Sabbath day activity at SLA. Our student leaders within the chaplaincy program, and there are a lot of student leaders at SLA, are prepared to continue leading within the church community. Two years ago, standing on the same platform, I spoke of the future by adapting with te technology. Infrastructure was put in place so that this year all academy students utilize iPads for their textbooks and other educational activities. I also stated that we were providing 21st century education in buildings and systems that were bit, built in the mid 20th century that and those systems were designed for a 19th century education. It is time to upgrade and renovate. Last spring, our constituency adopted a master plan for the school, which includes utilizing the work and effort of the previous generations with new investment by the current generations. The school administration was tasked with returning with a plan of how to address the process of rebuilding. Two weeks ago, Thursday, October 2nd, our school constituency overwhelmingly elected to engage Coleman stewardship to develop and conduct a spiritually based capital campaign for implementing the much needed renovations. Tonight, after Vespers at our alumni event in Changcheng Dining Facility, you will experience some of our local talent and also hear more details of this major step forward for SLA. 
SOA has changed. It had to to survive. We have met these challenges with success. We have now another challenge, the one of moving forward. The future is here. We must step boldly forward and accept it. Welcome to Alumni Sabbath. Good morning and welcome again to the 2014 South Lancaster Alumni Weekend. If you weren't here last night, you missed one of the best, wonderful, musical presentations by the South Lancaster Academy students. I cannot tell you how much we appreciate them and how talented they are. And we thank them again for this wonderful program that they presented last night. <clears throat> I want to thank Mr. Huff for uh, giving us the history of SLA and the accomplishments. I, I have to say that I arrived as a student on the camp this campus in the fall of 1959 as a junior. We lived in East Hall. And uh, to show you just a little bit of the contrast between the accomplishments of where South Lancaster is today and where it was back a few years ago, um, my father was a avid believer in Christian education. And he wanted me to be here, and I wanted me to be here. But he was also an avid follower of world events and current events. And in his office, he had a big world map and a big map of the United States. And if anything was happening in the world or in the United States, he'd take a colored pin and he'd stick it in that city or stick it in that country. And then he would say to my sisters and I, now that's where that's happening and this is how it's getting there and give us the history. Well, one day he arrived on campus and in 1960, Dwight Eisenhower gave his farewell speech. John Kennedy, was elected and he defeated Richard Nixon. The Soviet missile shot down a U-2 spy plane capturing CIA pilot Gary Francis, Francis Gary Powers. Fidel Castro nationalized all uh, uh, American property in Cuba. Israel captured Adolf Eichmann. Now when my father arrived here to see me on a regular basis, he'd say to me, well, what do you think about this? And I'd say, Dad, I have no idea what you're talking about. He'd say, well, don't you listen to the news? No, Dad, this is a boarding school. We don't have radios. We don't have television. We don't have newspapers. What do you mean you don't have newspapers? Can't you get a newspaper? I said, well, we can walk across the street to Devers, or we can walk up the street to Rowell's. But if I have money, I'd rather get an ice cream cone. So he says, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. I said, Dad, I'm 16 years old. I'm a junior. What girl reads the Wall Street Journal? He said, OK. Then I'm going to send you a subscription to Newsweek magazine. And I want you to read it, and I want you to share it in the dormitory. He said the Russians could be marching in the square up here, and you people would think it was the Boy Scouts. <laughs> but you know, that doesn't seem so far-fetched right now, because the Russians are marching in a square. But my father did send me the magazine, and I did share it. And it's just amazing that these students have their textbooks on uh, EEC textbooks, they have libraries at their disposal on their computers, and the, uh, the technology and the, the track that we've come, it just makes me so proud to be on either end of this school. I just love this place. And now at this time, we're going to do some uh, presentations uh, to the, with announcements. <laughs> Well, I can't top Donna with her story, so I'm not going to give you any stories. <laughs> but I do have a few announcements that we need to make just for everybody to keep in mind for the rest of the day today. Um, following church, lunch will be at the Shanshan Dining Commons, and that will be between 1 and 3. If you have not already got your tickets, they will be available at the door. Uh, at 3 o'clock, the honor classes will be meeting down at SLA. 
uh, in various classrooms and you'll find signs posted on the doors so that you'll know which room is for your class. Uh, tonight Vespers is going to be in the village church. Back in the day, many that was the church where a lot of people went and so we always try to incorporate that into our weekend as well. And that's going to be presented by the 40 year honor class. Supper is going to be back again at the Shanshun Dining Commons at 6.30 and as a, a Principal Huff said, it's being put on by the SLA school, and uh, that's no charge for that. But they're going to, uh, we're going to get a lot of talent and uh, other information about the new increase uh, that they're working on for incorporating new things at the school. And then I do also want to remind you that tomorrow evening at seven o'clock is the Steve Green concert right here in the uh, church here and tickets will be available on the door for that. So we hope all of you will join us for as many of these op opportunities as possible. Thank you. All right, now we wanna start with the recognition of our honor classes. This is always quite interesting to see who's here, who's not here. So we're gonna start with the youngest, well, almost the youngest. We wanna see is there anybody here at all from the five-year class, which would be 2009. And if you are, we would really like to have you stand up so we can see if you are here. And don't everybody jump at once. Alrighty, I'm not seeing anybody, so. They're probably at college somewhere still. They're working on their graduate degree. How about the 10-year class, class of 2004? Yes, we have. Two new mamas back in the back row there. <laughs> Very good. All right, and over here, great. It's good to see you. Okay, what about the 15-year class, 1999? Over here. Okay. Students, I want you to look around you again, like I said last year to you. Five, 10, 15 years, you're not seeing too many of your classmates. Get cohesive, get together. Keep your, your friendships going. Stay in touch with one another so that once you get to the point where you're in the five year, 10 year, 15 year class, you can stand up as a class because it's fun, it really is. Okay, what about our 20 year class, 1994? Over here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Very good. Go ahead. All right, let's try our 25-year class. That was a big class for me, I remember. Yes, look at that. Awesome. That is great. We're so glad that you're all here. And how about the 30-year class? Class of 1984. Yes. Good. Okay, now we'll go to our 40 year class. That would be 1970. We did, we skipped this 35 year class, I'm sorry. 35 year class, 1979. Am I missing anybody? No. Somebody up in the balcony, is that correct? Okay, yes. very good. Excellent. Okay, now the 40-year class, 1974, and that, the 1974 class will be presenting the worship vespers tonight in the uh, Village Church. Class of 1974, stand up. Oh, look over here. Okay. Sixty-nine, which is the forty-five year class. Yes. Okay. Yes. Fifty. Okay. Now this is usually our biggest class, and it is—it's not only just this year, but every year. It's, when you after fifty years, you really feel like you need to come back and connect. Okay. <laughs> the nineteen sixty-four class, fifty years. Stand up. Okay. 
the class of 1959, which would be the 55-year class. Ooh, lucky. Yes. They did a nice job as well getting all together. Now the class of 1954, the 60-year class. Now, do we have anybody here from the 65-year class, which would be 1949? Mm, don't see anybody from that class. Now, we have several, well, three at least. <laughs> In 1945, which would be actually 69 years. We have Eleanor Hodson. Is there anybody else from the class of 1945? Miss Hodson, would you please stand up? Where, where are you? Okay. Just gonna, you want me to go get her flowers and then you do Mrs. Gaston? very privileged today. We know we have at least one person here. Let's let him take his pictures first. We have one person here, a special lady here, who is from the class of 1939. Let's do your math. Miss Shirley Gaspy, would you please stand? That would be Shirley Benzinger. I'm sorry, Gatsby. For those that don't know, she didn't write it in the notes. <laughs> there is there is one more person that normal normally comes, and we're not sure that she's here. I haven't seen her. Is Alice Bowden here? I don't see her. She would. This would have been her 73rd year. She still lives in town, but she is not doing all that well. But we thought maybe she might make it. But we're sorry that she didn't. I don't see her. Okay, is anybody have more than 75 years since graduation? <laughs> we, we know there are a few 75 year olds in here, but since graduation. Okay, all right. Now, we have some different categories here, so listen carefully. Those who attended Browning Elementary or SLA, but did not, not, did not graduate from SLA, would you stand up? Very good. All right, the next category is, are there any here who attended Browning SLA but graduated from PVA because PVA then became the boarding school after 1965. Is there anybody here who attended both? All three. Very good. Very good. Okay, Mr. Huff was gonna to have to stand because he'd been the principal. Any other principals? teachers, and any other staff of SLA in any year. Would you please stand? Excellent. Thank you. All right, now, I, I like this category here. Is there any, I'm, well, I'm sure there are, all who served in any branch 
of the military. We would like you to stand. We know of one person, and I'm not sure of their name, that has come from Washington State. At that point, we think that may be the furthest point. Has anybody come from, well, Sheila has come from Bermuda. Well, there, there we go. I don't know. So that clears that up. I don't know up. which is the farthest, but. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> has anybody come outside the continental United States to attend today? Yeah, there's another Bermuda. Should I give it to Sheila? Huh? Should I give it to Sheila? Oh, no, we had one there, we had one there, and then a gentleman in the back. Okay. Well, that was, I don't know. I'll give him to Sheila. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll give him to her in a minute. Okay. Now, last but not least, as far as a small group to stand up, I would like to have the SLA alumni officers stand up. Janice Blood Kendrick from 66, she's the Vice President. She may have heard it. Oh, she's right okay. there. Stay standing, Janice. <laughs> Phyllis Fail Sable, 1965, Assistant Treasurer. Back, row. back in the back. June Hilbert Harris, I have no idea where she is. Oh, oh hi, June. Hi. <laughs> she's the Treasurer. John Nozick, the Alumni and Development Officer from 1966. And I don't know who she is either. And, and then, there, then there's me, Donna Burke Edmondson, the president. And I cannot put this week, did not put this weekend on by myself, I can assure you. And it even, it took more than the staff, but I want to thank them personally from up front, how much I appreciate the work that, that you've all done. To put this weekend on, it, it, it's not as easy as it looks. And I appreciate it, thank you. And we also want to thank the churches the College Church and the Village Church and their staff for allowing us to use the churches and the audiovisual uh, technicians and we just really appreciate it. We have one more category. All right, this is the one I always like to see too. We would like everyone who ever attended Browning SLA to please stand. Well, that's pretty much everybody in the room and we appreciate all of you for being here and we thank you and hope you will enjoy the rest of the weekend. It uh, feels good for me to be up here among the class of 1964 because in 1964 I was one. So I feel um, vibrant. Well, not really but I know some of you are up here, looking up here and looking at your bulletin, looking up here and you're saying, what is he doing up here? Well, I can tell you a 45 second story and that will answer your question because I was asking the same question. One day up in heaven, God said to all the men, men, I want you to form two lines. One line if you were the head of the house and the other line if the woman was the head of the house. After a few seconds, the lines were formed and God noticed that the line with the men at the head of the house, there was only one man standing in it all by himself. The other line that the woman was the head of the house was a hundred miles long. God said to the men, men, I don't understand this. This was not part of the plan. What went wrong? You were supposed to be the head of the house. The, the line with the woman was the head of the house was a hundred miles long. And this man is standing all by himself. He was the head of the house. He said, son, tell us, why are you in this line all by yourself? He said, I don't know. My wife told me to stand here. <laughs> now, now, my wife did not tell me to stand here today. Actually, Phyllis told me to stand here. <laughs> no, Phyllis invited me to stand up here. And also, today, I'm your worship leader. As an elder of the college church here, I welcome those here that are worshiping here today. And uh, one of our duties is to make sure the service runs smoothly and I tell people what to do when they come up here on the platform. So 
Again, thank you for being here today. So let's do our call to worship. It's in our back, the back of our hymnals. Our call to worship is number 791. 791 in back of our hymnals. Set your mind on God's kingdom. Number 791. I will read the fine print and the congregation will read the bold print. No servant can be slave of two masters, for either he will hate the first and love the second, or he will be devoted to the first and think nothing of the second. You cannot serve God and money. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow and reap and store in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You are worth more than the birds. Consider how the lilies grow in the fields. They do not work, they do not spin, and yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his splendor was not attired like one of these. How little faith you have. Do not ask anxiously, what are we to eat? What are we to drink? What are we to wear? Set your mind on God's kingdom and his justice before everything else, and all the rest will come to you as well. Thank you. Our opening hymn will be hymn number two. Hymn number two.
come today as we've just sung to praise you because of who you are. As we come today and as we worship here today, may your Holy Spirit be present in everything that takes place and that indeed we will meet you and know you and walk with you as we leave this worship service today. We pray in your name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. So good to see you all here. I love to see this big SLA family, and that's what we are as a family. And I wish we could get together more often, but I'm glad we do it every year. Today is a, uh, now is a time for you to participate in the program as well. Um, if you, you should have a white envelope in your program today. Any offerings that you want to go to SLA and the alumni need to go into this white offering uh, envelope. The loose offering will go to the college church. And at this time, uh, will the deacons please come forward?
thankful for the many blessings you bestow upon us. We are especially thankful for the blessing and the guidance that you have given to South Lancaster Academy. We pray that you will continue to do so. We pray that you will continue to move the hearts of our alumni who so graciously continue to give and support their school, that they will make the sacrifices as you do for, uh, for all of us, and your son has sacrificed for all of us. We ask all these things in your name, amen. story that never changes. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Father God, you have brought us through these years. Many, many miles we have traveled. We have seen the storm. We have seen the rough seas. We have come up the side of the mountain, Lord. If it was smooth, it would have been an easy journey. But you had a message for us and a lesson to learn, step by step, round by round. We had to go deep into our closet. We had to look into that mirror and see who we really are and the person you want us to become. Lord, I'm so glad that you showed me a sinner a sinner saved by grace. And I am thankful for that today. As we walk down these halls that we used to walk down, Lord, I pray that someone will remember they met the Lord right here on this campus, SLA, Browning, AUC. 
Lord, we had teachers who taught us lessons, gave us that foundation that we need, Lord. There are those who are still chained, Lord. We need to break those chains, break those chains of addiction, break those chains of alcohol, break every chain that is surrounding them this day, Lord. We pray that when they leave this auditorium, when they leave this sanctuary, that they will know that they have been in the house of the Lord. We pray for the pastor over this church and over this community, Lord. When we see all the things that have taken place in our past, we've seen terrorist attack, we see sickness now, Ebola. Lord, this is signs of the times. Lord, we should be running to the church. We should be running every time the doors are open. We should come in here and worship your holy name. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to serve this community and to serve this school. We have come afar. It's been 50 years, Lord, but some have still on the battlefield. Some have fallen short, Lord, but I pray, Father, that a word that is said to them today, they will say to you, Lord, I've fallen, but you're going to pick me up today. Lord, I want us to go by the wayside and see those who are lost. Check the list and see those who are lost and reach out to them, embrace them, show them the love that passes all understanding. Father, I thank you that you have seen fit for us to come to this place. We came from the north, we came from the east, we came from the south. Whichever direction we came is because of you. If we are a doctor, we're a lawyer, a teacher, a dentist, we could not do that without Jesus Christ in our life. Whatever we have become, Lord, it, no part of us, no part of us, but the Holy Spirit leading and guide us. We pray, Father, that we don't get so caught up in this world and the things of this world that we forget the cross where it all began. Lord, you were willing to die on that cross for a sinner like me so that we can see that you have a greater cause, a greater gift for each and every one of us. We pray, Father, that every child who goes through those doors of SLA will leave those school campus knowing that they have studied the word and they could take that word and share with the family, the friends, and the loved ones. Lord, we pray for the president of this United States, Lord. We see the pressure that he's under. We see those who are climbing the fence, getting into his building. We know that a Angels are surrounding him, that you are protecting him, Lord, to not allow things to come and touch him. Give him the leadership that he needs. Be all the, the leaders in this community, Lord, as they see this community growing and flourishing. Give them the direction they need so that they can fulfill the need that's coming from these young people. Let them come into a community that can use them. Their minds need to be used, Lord. We don't want to lose anyone. We don't want to lose any of our children, Lord. So we're praying now for our own children, Lord, that we will share with them the love of Christ, that we will continue to teach them lessons day after day because, Lord, the world is making everything so attractive that our children do not listen to us anymore. They want to see what their friends are doing. They want to watch, see what the TV is doing. They want to see what the media tells them. But thus says the Word of God, it will not change so let as we tenderly tenderly draw them close to us as we fall on our knees and we Beg out, Father, Father, forgive us for what we have done. We want to go home with you. When you come to gather us, when you come with that number that no man can number, I want you to say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. As we remember all the things of the past, we know, Father, we didn't come here this day on our own steam. That car that we drove up in, Lord, we didn't get that because of our job. We didn't get that because we have saved a lot of money. We got that because that's what you wanted us to have. From the day we were born to this present time, you knew everything that was going on in our lives. When we see things that we become shocked, surprised, Lord, you've already had the plan. So help us, Lord, to look to you for everything. Look to you from whence cometh our help. Look to you for guidance. Look to you, Lord, for that next job that we're waiting for. Look to you, Lord Jesus, when the times are rough and we don't know where the, the money's coming from the bills. Look to you. 
Father, there is no other place in this world that I would want to be but in the house of God. Help us to continue to reach out to each other. Help us continue to embrace each other. May a day not go by that we do not recognize that it's because of you that we stand today. It's because of you that we breathe in that breath of life. Nothing that we do, Lord, is on our own account. And I pray, Father, that you will use the speaker who's coming to us today, that you will touch her body, Lord, touch her mind, the words that she may have put on paper, Lord. Give it to her in the Holy Spirit and bless her and use her in a mighty way. Lord, 50 years is no time according to God's time. I pray, Father, also for every class of 1964 especially, as we united together in one accord. There may be some things that need to be uh, 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 gotten rid of. There may be some things we need to erase. There may be some things that we're still feeling hurtful for. But Lord, whatever it is that we found on that campus in 1964, I pray that the most important thing we found was Jesus Christ. Now, Lord Jesus, come into this sanctuary. May your presence be felt everywhere. May every boy, girl, man, woman, child feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. This day is my prayer. Let the church say amen. amen. What a wonderful time we have sharing with friends, acquaintances, and I look forward to the time when there will be a big reunion in heaven that we'll be able to share forever. Our scripture this morning is found in two texts. First one is in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And over in Jeremiah 20, Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Sheila graduated from SLA in 1964 with this 50th anniversary class. And she went on to graduate from Atlantic Union College in 1968. Now, her bio is in your bulletin there. It's in the next to the last page, and it's got good detail. So I'm just going to hit uh, some of the high points here and not uh, go into great detail. <clears throat> but uh, Sheila attended the Webster University, uh, and she did this by distance learning while she was living in uh, Bermuda. Uh, she obtained her a doctoral degree from uh, the University of the Caribbean in Mandeville, Jamaica. And uh, Sheila tells me uh, that she just retired. Was it this June, did you say? Yeah, this June, and she just completed her doctoral degree this year as well. Just in time to retire. That's the way it goes with PhD degrees though, isn't it? That's getting the thesis and everything uh, takes uh, a lot of time. And um, Sheila did her um, uh, thesis in the experience of expatriate teachers living and working in Bermuda. And um, while she was in Bermuda, uh, Sheila taught at the Bermuda Institute. Uh, there she was a counselor, she became a principal, and then eventually she became the superintendent of education for the Bermuda Conference. And uh, she retired from that position this year. Sheila's published a book. It's called The Samantha's Secret Hiding Place. And uh, on the personal side, Sheila has two sons and five grandchildren. She tells me one of her sons uh, is an oncologist. And uh, Sheila, congratulations. 
as a physician, I really appreciated the oncologists. They were some of the brightest guys in medicine because they took care of some of the most complicated patients. As you can appreciate, when people develop malignancies, uh, they, become, uh, they can become quite ill with a lot of different um, complications. And then your other son was an accountant. Is that not correct? Um, I just wanted, to, before Sheila uh, comes to the platform to give the morning message, I just wanted to share a couple little anecdotes uh, that uh, Sheila had when she was here as an academy student. She, was, uh, she came from Bermuda, so she lived in e the old East Hall. Is that still standing? I haven't, uh, okay, so that's been torn down and gone. I haven't seen that part of town recently. Uh, but anyhow, um, as you can appreciate, there's not a lot of snow in Bermuda. <laughs> and so uh, when Sheila hit her first snow here while living there in the dorm, uh, her friends took it upon themselves to drag her out. Was it in the middle of the night? In the middle of the night and wash her face in the snow. And among them was Pat Tapper and uh, some of the other uh, uh, roommates and various, uh, well, I don't know if you could call them friends if they wash your face in the snow. But anyhow, uh, she thought that was very interesting. And then uh, the other experience that uh, we kind of got a chuckle at uh, was, as you can appreciate, the folks in Bermuda, their footwear consists primarily of sandals. You know, it's kind of tropics-like and so forth. And so when Sheila came to SLA, uh, she decided to continue to wear her sandals. But the girl's dean took one look at that. She said, no, Sheila, no sandals. She said, what are you talking about? You know, this, this is what we wear. And the boys might see your toes. <laughs> You know, I, I find that rather amazing. Uh, you know, I was a student at PUC in the mid-60s, just a couple of years after that, on the leading edge of the free sex and the drugs. Used to hang out in San Francisco, and to think that just a couple of years before, the dean was uh, talking to the students about <laughs> exposing their toes. Uh, nonetheless, I think uh, we will be delighted to hear the message that uh, Sheila has to share with us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to thank the planning committee for selecting me to speak to you today. At least, I think I want to thank them. I am privileged to participate in the events of the weekend and to be a member of the distinguished class of 1964. And even though you stood before, I need you to stand again, class of 1964. Thank you. I remember back then when we were attending SLA that we said, we're not coming back for these events. Those folks look really old. <laughs> but if you looked at us, something must have happened with the numbers because we're looking great. I also would like to give a special shout out to my colleague, Ron Huff, the principal of SLA. Ron, I didn't bring a tent and no bags. And if you would please ask him what that means, I'll be delighted. This weekend is an opportune time to reminisce about the joys and the sorrows, the tears and the laughter and the pranks don't forget the pranks, and I won't call the names of the pranksters that we shared together. Uh, O.J. Mills? I won't call any names. <laughs> I am glad that SLA is still here, still standing strong and continuing to make a contribution to this community, to the Seventh-day Adventist work and to the world. It's so delightful to reconnect with my classmates and friends and to visit our old stomping grounds, except we can't visit East Hall. I pondered a while before accepting this invitation. I was really hoping that I had discouraged Phyllis from pursuing me to be the speaker. I did not readily return her calls or answer her emails. 
I was just hoping she would ask someone else. But she was persistent. And I just pinched myself and it hurt. So I guess I am standing here. Please bow your heads with me as I offer a prayer. Father, we invite your Holy Spirit into this place. May my words be pleasing to your ears and uplift and encourage the hearers. In your name, amen. The title of my message today is Journey On, Journey On. I am declaring right up front that I'm not a preacher. Neither am I the daughter of a preacher. I do not hold a theology degree nor a public speaking degree. In fact, whenever I had to get up front, my father would say before I went up, speak up, talk louder. However, I was quite happy saying little and in a soft voice. So I will not undertake today to preach a sermon with a death thumping, rousing sound. Many people have penned life as a journey, or an expedition, or a passage, or an excursion. I'm sure that when I mention the word journey, depending on your perspective, many images may enter your mind. The wide, straight roads of the West, the narrow, winding roads of the countryside, roads on an unbeaten track, the busy roads of New York City, or maybe no roads come to your mind at all. You may picture a journey as a cruise on the ocean or on the Mediterranean Sea. Or for that matter, you may think of a journey as a flight in the boundless skies. No matter, no one embarks on a journey by just standing still. Some aspect of movement is involved. My friends, all of us are on a journey. I believe that Martin Luther King had it right when he said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. And if you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, get moving. Many, many Bible characters' lives have been depicted as a journey. God sent Abraham on a journey of faith to a place that he did not know where he was going. Enoch embarked on a spiritual journey, walking with God so that one day the journey was so sweet that God took him home. What about Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, who took that faithful journey to Moab that resulted in so much death for that family. And then there are others, Daniel and his three companions, Joseph, Moses. What about Elijah's journey and Paul's missionary journeys? All of our life journeys began at death, began at birth, and hopefully they will not end at death, for death is but an earthly pause and if we have accepted Jesus as our Savior, we will rise again to eternal life, and then we'll have an endless journey. A well-known poet in this part of the country, Robert Frost, penned one of my favorite poems. I know you know it too. Two roads diverged. Two roads diverged into a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. And then he goes on with the next couple of verses, but I like how it, the poem ends. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged into a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. These famed words resonate with my own personal experience. I, along with you, are traveling on a road. My life journey began on the island of Bermuda, and that, in a sense, was a road less traveled. With a population of only 62,000 people, Bermuda is located in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, 700 miles at sea, 
and one of the nine most isolated regions in the world. How then did I end up at South Lancaster Academy at 14 years old? My parents had never seen South Lancaster Academy. In fact, up to about six months before I came, they'd never even heard of it. I was just completing my elementary school, grade eight, at the only Adventist school on the island, so I was destined for public school. However, my parents, public school was not in my parents' vision for me. They wanted me to have an Adventist Christian education, and so they began to research Adventist schools abroad. And then I ended up at South Lancaster Academy. While living in Bermuda, I could not have imagined such fast-moving vehicles. Our speed limit then and still is 20 miles per hour. I could not imagine dorm life or eating in the cafeteria. I couldn't imagine the changing of the seasons, the exquisite, superb fall foliage that we're experiencing even today, and snow and so much snow. I couldn't imagine snowball fights and frostbite and falling on the ice and being so cold that it hurt to breathe. When I experienced that first New England winter, I thought I would freeze to death. When I reflect on my parents' decision to send me to SLA, I realize that it took such great faith to send me to another country at such a young age all by myself. It speaks to the faith, the confidence, and the value they had placed in Christian education. They believed that if God, they trusted God, that everything would work out. You know, my parents have both died now, and my father, he never did visit SLA, or AUC for that matter. He felt he never needed to. He had given his daughter to God, and he had sent her to South Lancaster Academy. I too have become a champion of Adventist education. I believe strongly in it. I believe in the values and the goals and the outs, out, expected outcomes of Adventist education. I've worked in Adventist education for more than 40 years, and I've just retired, yay, yay, yay. <laughs> and retirement is wonderful. You should try it, Ron. The rewards of having all of our children taught of the Lord, as it says in Isaiah 53, cannot be outweighed by earthly gain. Some of our classmates have already ended the earthly part of their journey and are resting. Life is so precious but fleeting, and none of us know what the future holds, so it's important for us to live well. My personal journey has taken me over some hills. I've encountered some mountains. I've camped out in some valleys, and I've fallen in some ditches. I've incurred some bumps and scratches and some wisdom along the way. Life has taught me the strength of humility, the futility of pride, and the emptiness of achieving money, power, and status at the price of your soul. Journeys are not always straight. Sometimes they are a process of twists and turns and even detours. God, yet, yet God has given us sunsets and sunrises along each junction. He lovingly draws us to himself, providing light for our path and, keep us, and keeps us from slipping and stumbling. When embarking on a journey, we usually see markers along the way. We may even check our GPS to see how far or how close we are to our destination. On my life journey, the first most important sign I encountered, and I encountered it right at a week of prayer in Lanham Hall, and that marker was God straight ahead. How fitting. I encountered God at that week of prayer, and I could stop right here and simply say, God is. Because God is, 
He is the great I am. He is eternal. He embodies love. Without him, life would not exist. God is mercy and grace. Have you noticed that the Bible does not even try to justify God or to prove his existence? It just predisposes that he is. Stop and think for a moment. Not only is that miraculous that God is, it is more of a miracle that we, finite beings, can communicate with him, this God of the universe, who's omnipresent, who's omnipotent, who is omnipotent. God welcomes us into relationship. We can talk to him. We can tell him our deepest desires and joys. We can whisper or shout our disappointments and regrets. God is the supreme being. He's Elohim, the strong one. He's Al Shaddai, God Almighty. He's Adonai, the master owner. Let's celebrate the fact that God is. As Psalms 148.13 says, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. Tucked away in the side of a hill, I encountered another signpost as I continued on my journey. It read, love. Love is an attribute of God. It is the core characteristic of his love, of his character. It is the supreme expression of his personhood. It is the doorway to knowing God intimately. God chose to love us. It is an act of his will. He communicates to us in so many ways, through the Bible, through the birth of a child, through nature. The greatest expression of God's love to us is in the Bible. It is found in John 3.16. Let us repeat it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God is the essence of love. In 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 8, are some of the most beautiful and meaningful words that define God's love to us. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. <coughs> love does not dishonor others. <coughs> Sorry. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes. Love never fails. Imagine, imagine a love like that. What a different world we would experience if we could exhibit such characteristics in our interactions with our family and our fellow men. Just think of all the marriages that would be saved. Think of all the well-adjusted young people. And think of all the wars that would not be fought. We can be the change we want to see, says Mahatma Gandhi. We are to love in word and in deed. My GPS, however, revealed another sign up, <coughs> up front as I continued on my journey. This one said, gratitude. This is such a meaningful sign. Being in an attitude of gratefulness means that we will show appreciation and kindness to those who are traveling on the journey with us. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will. Rejoice continually and give thanks in all circumstances. God has done so much for us to bless us. We should be thankful. It's all about being in the attitude of thankfulness. 
Have you heard the story of two friends who met each other on the street one day? One friend looked forlorn and almost on the verge of tears. And so his friend said to him, what has the world done to you, my friend? The said friend replied, let me tell you, three weeks ago my uncle died and left me with $40,000. That's a lot of money, responded the other friend. But you see, two weeks ago, a cousin I never knew died. He left me $85,000. Sounds to me like you're blessed. You don't understand. Last week, my great uncle passed away and I inherited almost a quarter of a million dollars. Now the friend was very confused. Then why do you look so glum? This week, nothing. <laughs> How quickly we can become ungrateful. How quickly we can take for granted all of the blessings that God has sent his way. I read a quote by the famous Anonymous. It said, what if you woke up tomorrow with only what you're thankful for today? What a sobering thought. We must be thankful for what we have. Be grateful for all that we have received from life. In all things and in every situation, we can choose to be grateful. As I continued my journey, the next sign that I encountered read prayer. Not only are we to be grateful, but we are to pray continually. One key reason we pray is because God has commanded us to pray. If we are obedient to his will, then prayer will be a regular part of our life journey. Ellen G. White wrote that prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. And once we understand the true purpose and nature of prayer, it can make a profound difference in the direction we are traveling. Prayer is not a monologue, but a dialogue. God's voice is the most important part. Prayer at its highest is a two-way conversation. Prayer not only strengthens our relationship with God, but when we pray with other believers, prayer strengthens the bonds between fellow Christians. Sometimes our journey takes us through the valley. I saw a marker with a finger pointing to the right. It was part of the journey less traveled, and the sign simply read, Forgiveness. In Ephesians 4.32, it reads, Be kind and compassionate one to another, forgiving each other, as Christ has forgiven you. We must forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. And on the journey that we're traveling, I'm sure we've had to forgive over and over and over again. Maybe even 70 times seven? That's a lot of forgiveness. But remember, we are being forgiven too. They're not just, we're not just doing forgiving, others are forgiving us. Let's not forget that forgiveness is a gift we give to ourselves. Dr. Stephen Marable said, forgiveness is a reflection of loving yourself enough to move on. God forgives us on a daily basis, our spouses, our children, our coworkers, our neighbors, Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. We are on a spiritual journey when we truly learn how to forgive. Forgiveness does not change the past, nor does it change the wrong act that was committed, but it does change our future. When we let it go, whatever the hurt is, it puts us in the driver's seat. 
Forgiveness has been one of the best blessings I have received during one of my detours. Another signpost said, grow and develop. Didn't Jesus grow and develop while he was here on earth? In Luke 2, 52, it says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That text embraces all aspects of growing. Spending time with God deepens our relationship with him. Our faith grows too when we spend time with God. Academically, and this is especially for the class of 64, we should continue to grow. Uh, Myron just shared with me outside that he's retired or about to retire, but he's going to take another master's degree from the class of 64. We are to become lifelong learners. We weren't giving any instructions that said we are to stop learning as we get older. Physically, we are admonished to keep our bodies healthy, no matter what our age is. Isn't it an honor that our bodies are the temple and the dwelling place of God? In May of this year, I purchased a digital tracker called a Fitbit. Have you heard of it? I set a goal of walking 10,000 steps a day, at least five days a week. Since May 11th, I have walked over 1 million steps. I've completed 500 miles. I've lowered my blood pressure. I've shed some unwanted pounds, yes. I really try to get those steps in. Sometimes I don't accomplish my goal, and it's late at night, and much to my husband's regret, I jump in the car, and I drive into Hamilton, which is only about five minutes away, and I finish up getting my miles. It's really great. I also set a goal to read the Bible every day, and that decision is helping me to strengthen my relationship with God. We can give back in so many ways, and the last sign said, contribute and give back. Mother Teresa said, it's not how much we give, but how much love we put into the giving. The Bible says, God loves a cheerful giver. We can give our time, we can give our love to our families, we can give our talents to the church and the neighbors. The well-known statesman Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. We can give our money. The Bible says to lay up treasures in heaven. I recently read a book entitled The Soul of Money. Quite interesting. Even the title intrigued me. And the author said that uh, money is the most motivating, miraculous, maligned, and misunderstood part of the contemporary life. But my friend, money only has the power that we assign it. Money is on a loan to us. It really belongs to God. Our goal is not to make money, but to use money as a tool. Money can be a terrible master, but it's an excellent servant. Now, we're all on a journey, and you may not have encountered the signs that I've encountered. But we all had to get ready. We all packed our bags to come here, if you live far enough away. And so in your luggage, I'd like for you to pack in the gift of time. Someone told me that time is a predator. It stalks us. But I believe time is a companion. It goes with us on our journey and reminds us to cherish every moment, because we will not get that moment again. So rise early and make the most of your 24 hours. View some beautiful sunsets and some great sunrises. Mar Harvey Marquet says, time is free, 
but it's priceless. You can't earn it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you've lost it, you can never get it back. Then I suggest you pack in some inspiration. Read your Bible, which is the greatest source of wisdom and inspiration. You will find food for your soul. Pack in some grit and some persistence. Thomas Edison refused to give up. He failed at least a thousand times while trying to invent the light bulb. James Dyson, known for his creation of the, vac of the bagless vacuum cleaner, took 5,127 prototypes before he got it right. So we should refuse to give up. The Bible says, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And then we have to put in some hope in that bag. Hope lies eternal in the human breast. When we hope, we anticipate the best. Hope sustains us on our journey. No matter how perilous that journey is, God will be with us, as we heard in our scripture text this morning. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for a disaster, but plans to give you hope and a future. And then I suggest you pack in some hope, some faith. Packing in faith will sure us up for the journey. Faith makes us certain of the realities we do not see. Faith is trusting that God will do what he says he would do. Now your luggage should be quite full. And so, like I often have to do, I have to take some things out of my luggage. And I'd like to suggest that you take these three things out. Leave out fear. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear will paralyze your best efforts. God says perfect love casteth out fear. So don't pack any fear on your journey. Fear will cancel your faith and it will immobilize your actions. Then I'd like to suggest that you leave behind anxiety and worry didn't you hear the reading, the call to worship this morning? The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. His eye is on the sparrow, and so we know he cares for us. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. We can find comfort and peace by meditating on God's word. And the third thing that you should take out so you'll have room to put other things in is negativity and complaining. It's so easy to complain. We complain about our neighbors, crying babies, late flights, the price of gasoline, jobs, or lack of jobs. We complain about the president. We have become a society that is quick to complain. A quote by Tom Wilson puts it in perspective for me. He says, you can complain because roses have thorns, or you can rejoice that thorns have roses. Complaining doesn't change the circumstances. Mayor Angelo wisely questioned, what are you supposed to do when you don't like a thing? Her answer, change it. If you can change it, change the way you think about it. When we complain less, it allows gratitude to grow. And so as I draw this message to a close, I'd like to just share that theme text again found in Jeremiah 6:16. 6, it reads, stand by the roads and look, and ask for the ancient paths, the good way, where the good way is, and walk in it and find rest for your soul. Take a moment, look at those verbs, stand, Look, ask, and walk. The first admonition is for us to stand. Just stand, just be still, and know that God is God. And after we stand, we must look. Didn't we learn early to look both ways before we cross the street? In Isaiah 45, 22, it says, look unto me and be ye saved, for I am God, and there is none else. And after looking, we must ask. 
We don't know everything. Judges 18.5 says, ask counsel, we pray of thee, that we may know the way to go so that we can be prosperous. And only then, after we've done those, we are commanded to walk. Michael, Micah 6.8 says, in part, what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? No, our journeys are not the same, but be assured there are only two destinations, and I'm sure we all want to be in the destination where we will be with our God. So navigate your journey well. I invite you at this time to rededicate your life, to be on a good path. And if you want to hear those words from God's lips that say, well done, I invite you to raise your hand with me because I want to hear those words from God that say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. In the Message magazine, Paul puts it this way when talking to Timothy. There's only one race worth running, and I have run hard right to the finish. I have believed all the way. There's nothing left now but God's applause. So my friends, classmates, journey on, journey on. Let's plan to meet again where the journey will never end. Journey on. Stand.
Shall we pray? Lord, you are indeed the author of the journey of each person in this room. You have indeed been with us, all of us, as we have walked these halls and as we have walked through life. We do not wish to journey on without the gift of your presence and without the gift of your spirit, without your love and your power. For these things we would pray for each person here, that most of all, as we began our journey with you, we might indeed finish it in your kingdom. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.